Welcome back. Week three. Yes, I know last week's lecture was a killer. I'm aware. It wasn't supposed to be. That's how it ended. Um, this week should be less painful because I got multiple places I can just stop. Whereas last week's was very hard to chop. Now, what we're going to cover today is actually I'm going to talk about the modeling process, the actual process of modeling, as opposed to last week, which was just a terminology dump that talked about all the different bits and pieces. Um, there is going to be some review from the stuff from last week, but since I covered it in detail already, I'm just going to go through the slides quickly just so we're back to roughly what we would need it to be last week. So that's why this lecture should actually be fairly short, because I'm not going to spend 10 minutes explaining what an entity is. All right. For starters, database model. I did speak about that a bit last week. A database can be modeled either as a collection of entities or as relationships amongst entities. Depending on who you ask, they mean the same thing, essentially. What are the connections of the stuff? Um, the most common is an ERD, an entity, entity relationship diagram, and it's usually a blueprint. And an ERD is the end result of the design process. Now, an ER model allows us to sketch database designs from the most basic one, which is a conceptual, all the way to a very precise one, which is the physical diagram. There's usually graphical tools, a variety, there's tons of them that go from free, like the ones you guys are using, to uh, currently, I guess one of the best ones on the market is, uh, I guess SCP bought it a few years ago, it's called Power Designer. It sells for about $16,000 a seat for the fully fledged edition. The cheap version is 1500 bucks, And I've used it. It's actually really, really nice to work with. You get what you pay for. <laughs> but it has not updated in years. So, you know, it's a bit of one of those things. Um, ERDs are used everywhere in database design. You'll never get away from not using an ERD of some sort. Um, and the ERDs also model identifies the concepts and the entities that exist in the system, how they're interconnected. Now, these are really old slides that I've used for years, thus some of the weird formatting with the highlighted red. I've stopped doing that. I figured you guys know how to use highlighters on your own, but I didn't see the point of actually changing my slides if I don't need to. An ERD serves several purposes. A database analyst or designer, based on the diagram, as actually, let me rephrase that. Based on the process of creating the diagram, will have a better understanding of what the data is. Essentially, as you work your way through to creating the diagram, you can't create the diagram unless you understand what makes the diagram. So a system architect, database analyst, amongst other names, will have a better understanding of what is contained inside the database. It's a documentation tool. One of the most important things in IT is documentation. I'm sure already in your Java course, they're being anal retentive about how much you comment. Comment everything. Uh, later on, you'll learn about common things that make sense to comment, but it's better to over-comment than under-comment. Um, we're in the process at, at work where somebody's leaving the company, and we're trying to get him to document his stuff so a gerbil could do his job. And his answer to everything is, just Google it, so so do you. No, not good enough. You know, so there's challenges here. So documentation is really important. A diagram allows somebody else who's coming into the project take a glance and actually understand how things are interconnected. And an ERD, especially the conceptual, once you get to the, the physical one, that's not so much this, it's really good to explain to your users, also known as your customers or your you know, people that are giving you money, even if you are developing for internal purposes, so like I mostly do, most of my development's for in-company use, I still give diagrams to the management. Why? So they understand what the heck I'm talking about. And they technically are my clients because they're paying me to be there and do the work. Re regardless if your client is your boss or your client is someone outside the company, you have to be able to communicate them to them clearly and simply. And conceptual ERDs are fantastic for that job. It just shows them that you understand what the heck they're talking about. Or at least you can make them understand why some of their ideas are stupid. Trust me, there's a whole lot of IT of uh, system analysis and design that's involving telling your customer how stupid they are without saying they're stupid. You just tell them there's a better way. 
We can implement this in a, in a more sane manner. We can optimize your data flow. Those are magic keywords saying to your customer you're an idiot, just so you know. So when you look at an ERD, there's four pieces. And I actually did cover it last week. There's the entity, the relationship, the cardinality, and then attributes. Attributes are optional at the conceptual level. Now, what is a relationship? There's two kinds, optional and mandatory. There's, remember when I talked about um, last week and I talked about the cardinality and the, whatever the heck the other phrase is, I'm drawing a blank. But anyways, they're basically the little diagrams on the lines, the little symbols. An optional relationship is one where the data may or may not be connected. For example, an employee may or may not be assigned to a department. Or in my case, I'm assigned to multiple departments. A patient may or may not be assigned to a bed. Anybody who's gone through the health system in Ontario knows this experience really well. You go to the emergency, they give you a bed, and then they put you on a bed and they stick you in the hall for about six hours while you wait for a bed. They've gotten better. They now have little rooms where they park you, where somebody actually keeps an eye on you. But there once was a time years ago where they called, literally called it hallway medicine. Um, and at that point, you're on a bed, but you're not assigned to a bed. Right? So you're a patient. You may have a bed or not, but you're sitting on one, but it's not yours. You're there temporarily. Mandatory relationships. Every course must be taught by at least one teacher. Can you imagine if you walked in here and the teacher is optional? I don't feel like coming today. I'm feeling cute. Every mother, which is not so true, but a every mother has a child if they've had kids. But in this case, it's, a, it's sort of a, an optional mandatory thing. Um, but essentially, if you have a kid, the kid has a mother. That's what this is saying. Uh, if you don't have a kid, then obviously no mother but every kid has a mother. They came from somewhere. We're not pumping people out of tubes yet. Right? We're not tanking. We're not decanting people yet. Cardinality constraints expresses the number of entities that can be associated via the relationship. So I covered that a little bit last week also. But essentially, there's a minimum cardinality and a maximum cardinality. Maximum cardinality is a stupid phrase. Uh, I'll explain that in a second. But minimum means if the minimum is zero, then it's optional, as in a bed has zero or more um, beds, uh, beds, right? So patient bed, zero or more. If one or more, then it's mandatory. In other words, a child must have a mother. They can only have one mother, which comes back to the maximum cardinality. The maximum cardinality means one of two things. One or more than one. So which is a, kind of a weird phrase when they say maximum cardinality, because you can't say it's one, maybe two, ah, four. No, it's either one or more than one. There's no in between. There's no maximum number once you go past one. So for example, a bed, and a patient may have a bed, and they can only ever be assigned to one bed in most cases. There are cases where they have to put two beds together, but that's not cool. But more usually you're assigned to one bed, end of story. And usually by the mean a bed is not they gave you a physical bed, is you're assigned to a slot in a room somewhere. You know, you're in bed two of ward six on floor five. Foop. That is maximum cardinality, as in a patient can only ever have one bed. On the other hand, I could have multiple students. So I have zero, one, or more students. Optionally, I might not have any students. I could only have one student, or I could have many students, depending on what the setup is. And I'm not even going to cover this, because I covered it in much more detail last week. But essentially, you've got the three kinds of relationships. One to one, one to many, many to many. A teacher teaches many students, and a student is taught by many teachers. That's a many to many. And we actually take that out and use a different kind of entity for that job. All right, here's our diagrams. Remember last week I was trying to find my darn diagram? It was supposed to be this week. I even put it in the announcement where I had a brain fart, where I forgot I'd moved it to this week so it made sense. Those are your four symbols. So the first one at the top, 
is mandatory one. In other words, if you're talking about a child, an actual kid, they have one and only one mother. They must have a mother, and they can only ever have one biological mother. Mandatory many. A course must have one or more students to be able to run. Realistically, we usually want 25 students in a group to run a course. Unless it's a very specialized course, but it's that much. Optional one, a patient may have a bed. So that's this third one down, where you got the circle and the line. So it's saying it's one and only one if they want it, or if it applies. And then you've got optional many, which is a mother may have zero, one, or more children if they choose to. I'm using that as a phrase. A woman, I was trying to be non-gender binary. You know, I was saying woman, take your pick how you want to apply that phrase as opposed to if I say a, you know, a thing. A woman may or may not have children. It's their choice. It's optional many. They choose to have kids or not. Many to many is essentially, you take either sets of these symbols and they're at each end of the relationship that line. Like right now, I'm only demonstrating one end of the line. Usually, uh, if you're using, see these little diamonds right here? That's a relationship symbol. There'll be another line coming out of there and there'll be the similar symbols on the other side describing the relationship on both sides. But these are the four symbols that you'll use. There, there are no other symbols other than these. So these are going to be at each end of the line. So, for example, here's an example that doesn't have the diamond in it, that doesn't have the relationship diamond. And here's an example where um, each school may enroll many students or may not enroll any students at all. But a student can only ever attend one school at a time. So most of the time, and this is very, you know, specific, but most students in Ontario are registered in only one school at a time. Not talking post-secondary, let's talk grade school, high school, primary, you know, post or secondary. Post-secondary, you can be as many schools as you want if you want to torture yourself and you have unlimited funds. But, you know, when you go, you're in grade one, you're in grade one. And you're only in one school at one for grade one. That means you can be at, your, you must attend grade one, theoretically. And you can only ever attend it at one school. That's what this is saying. So the symbols indicate each unit attends at least one and at most one. And the school has at least at most many. That's what the symbols mean. So essentially, the symbols at this end of the line describe how school is related to student. The symbols at this end of the line indicate how student is related to school. So whatever's at the opposite end of the line of the symbol is it's how it's related to whatever you're pointing at. Now there's steps when you identify entities and create ERDs. And the step, first step is identifying the entities. Now, you can see there's a whole lot of steps in here. There's identify the entities, find relationships, draw up a rough ERD, fill in your cardinality, define your primary keys, if applicable, at this point we're falling into logical land. Draw key-based ERDs, identify the attributes, map the attributes, draw the fully attributed ERD, at this point it's called the logical diagram, a logical ERD as opposed to a conceptual. Then you check results, as in, does this make sense? Now, here's a simple example. And it's a blob of text. God, I'm not going to read it because I'm not that great at reading out loud. But there's a blob of text. If you've got the slides with you, great. If you don't, I'm going to switch to the next slide because it's starting to highlight stuff. Same blob. 
So the very first step is to identify the ent entities. So if you're given a blob of text or a series of documents or an, what they call an executive summary, in other words, somebody wrote up a summary for you and left out half the important details, but you know, you're given a blob, so therefore you're starting with this blob and you're going to start identifying stuff. And one popular way of doing it is using a highlighter or, you know, circling words, whatever. It actually can be very tactile, this process, if you want it to be. If you're a hands-on kind of person, this is great. Um, so a company has several departments. Now you'll notice that the, the only time something is highlighted is the first time the word appears, whether it's plural or singular. Because if the same word appears more than once and you've already identified it, you don't need to repeat it. Whether it's plural or singular, it's the same thing. It's just one is multiple copies of, you know. So a company, a company got highlighted because a company is a thing, has several departments. Departments are a thing. Okay, that's two. Each department, notice we don't need to highlight department because we've already identified department as a thing, has a supervisor and at least one employee. <coughs> and employees must be assigned to at least one, but possibly more departments. We're not talking about relationships yet. We're just talking about entities. So nowhere in there is there something new. If one employee is assigned to a project. Oh, that's something new. Highlight that. And if I were to read the rest, I'm not going to come up with new things. Now, have you noticed what's being highlighted specifically in this? They're nouns. Nouns usually identify people and or things or and or events and or, you know, objects of some sort or concepts. When I say student, that's not a verb or an adjective. That's a noun. I'm saying it's a student. It's a thing. Yes. Where do you see vacation? Yeah, that's maybe. that They're, they're actually, pl yes, technically it is. But they were actually applying it as a relationship in this case. Maybe. Um, yes, you're right if we really want to go there. Um, but then in this case, the way they're using it, just I had to reread that sentence. They're talking about an employee may be on vacation and not assigned to our project. So they're actually, that's like a whole conditional phrase. In other words, an employee may be on vacation, also known as getting hit by a bus, or not employed anymore, or on disciplinary suspension, because they're going on vacation to go get some therapy. Insert reason why they're not available. They're not talking, about, they're using, in this case, vacation could be used for multiple things, not just saying they're not there. Basically, they're saying they're not there, and therefore they may not be assigned to a project while they're not there. But you're right, yes, depending on how the rest of that would have been worded, it would have been a noun. So we actually have, way back in the day, a lot of people don't use this technique anymore, but it's a great way to do this, is building a chart. And considering, you know, everybody has access to whiteboards and or computerized whiteboards, also known as Excel, or, you know, the, some of those study rooms over there where you actually got glass walls, you can write on the glass walls, like the ones in B building. You know, there's all kinds of tools you have. Or we could break up the old school solution. Remember the old car, the piece pad of paper on an easel? Oh, yeah. yeah, those work. Whatever works for you. You can do it on a piece of paper if you're doing it by yourself, obviously. Uh, at work, I used to have a whiteboard as big as this on my wall. My, everything was just written on the whiteboard. Um, then it fell off the ball and broke. So, you know, such is life. They didn't want to replace it. But you have a chart like this. And essentially, it's a typical cross-reference chart where you got the same things on two different axes. And you're going, to tr you're going to connect how things are related to each other. And it's a relationship matrix, rows and columns. And you'll have them literally going side by side. It looks a bit like a round robin results table for those that play sports. Now, once you've built up your chart of how things are related to each other, you start filling in basically um, verbs and or adverbs or how, choose how things are connected. And you'd look at this for this first example, the, the department row. Department has no relation to department because, well, 
it's the same. A department and an employee, an employee is assigned to a department and supervisor, so a department is run by a supervisor. And then you build a chart going in both directions. So you'll have an employee belongs to the department, a supervisor runs a department, an employee works on a project, a project uses an employee. Yes, and a project uses an employee because you're all resources that can be used up and thrown away. Um, do you think I'm kidding? Depending where you work, it's only going to be your existence. But don't go work there. <laughs> uh, but essentially, at this point, it, yes. Because a supervisor runs a department, so a supervisor could have multiple employees. So the supervisor is in charge of a department, and the employees belong to that department. It's a bit like how I'm in charge of this class, and you guys belong to this class. So by relationship reasons, I'm in charge of this group of students. Right? Do you see what I mean? Yeah, he's still got a blank. That's what I'm saying. I'm asking, do you, do you know roughly what I mean? As in, a supervisor is in charge of a department, and the department may change supervisors on a regular basis. Right? If you ever worked in the government, you know exactly how fast department heads change. Because the guy got promoted, sometimes there's changes every month. It's crazy. And at the same time, employees change departments. And therefore, everybody's related via the department. If you had to actually change the relationship for every you know, supervisor to employee, that'd be rough. Because let's say the supervisor's in charge of 500 people, you have to update 500 records. But if you update the connection to just the department, then it's just one change. They do on the other side where an employee belongs to one department. And if he doesn't belong to that department anymore and changes the department, you just update the one entry instead of having to change a bunch of other records. Okay, so thanks to our chart, we identified the following things. A department is assigned an employee. In other words, a department is made up of employees. A supervisor runs the department. So a supervisor is in charge of the department regardless of who's actually there. You can have a person that's in charge of a department there's no one else there. That's also known to happen. An employee belongs to a department. So we know for a fact that they belong to a department because they've been assigned to it. An employee works on a project. A supervisor runs a department and a project uses an employee. So now we end up drawing the rough ERD. So you place all the entities in, tri in rectangles and you use diamonds and lines to represent the relationships between the entities. Something like this. L later on, it'll actually get more defined as we finish off this process. But you'll see an employee works on a project. There's no cardinality set yet. A department is run by a supervisor. The what's in that little box is your choice of how you word it. A lot of people actually choose to put in both sides of the argument. As in, an employee works on a project slash project is assigned an employee. It's up to you if you want to put it. It really does make a difference. It's your choice. And then, a department is assigned an employee. So if you go back over this way, so an employee works on a project, we know that for a fact. That's how it was worded. A department is assigned an employee, and technically when you look at it, an employee is assigned to a department also. So that phrase works for both sides. Ideally, you want to try to find a phrase that works for both. And there is a really lazy way of doing this. You put in the word has, <laughs> just has. An employee has a department, a department has employees. If you're really lazy and you can't figure out your sense, just use the word has. It'll work. Nobody can argue with you that it's wrong. So in the end, once we draw all the lines and connect everything up together, you have something that looks like this. A supervisor runs a department. A department is run by a supervisor. Trust me, the supervisor is not run by the department, no matter what they tell you. A department is assigned to an employee and vice versa. And an employee works on a project. At this point, we have the most basic conceptual diagram 
you can get. There's no cardinality, none of that on there. However, you could literally take this, go up to your manager and say, does this make sense to you? And theoretically, they should be able to understand this, in theory. Anybody who's ever had a manager know exactly what I mean by in theory. So next step is filling in cardinality. Each department has one supervisor. Can't have too many chefs in the kitchen. Therefore, you have got one head chef. A department. Each supervisor has one department. Each employee can belong to one or more departments. And this assumes that they belong to at least one. An employee, each department must have one or more employees. And each project must have one or more employees. Project, each employee can have zero or more projects, assuming they're, they're not on vacation. See, now every time you hear the word vacation, you're going to think about me talking about getting hit by a bus. I ruin phrases for people. And this slide's really terrible. It, I don't know why, but it screwed up my colors. Um, but these are carnality examples. I already covered these, so I don't need to do it again. So here we go. A department has, must have a supervisor, can only ever have one supervisor. And a supervisor can only be in charge of one department. And they can't be a supervisor unless they're assigned to a department. Otherwise, they're an employee. Here's a many-to-many -many relationship going on down the middle there, down the side. So a department must have at least one employee, but can have many. And each employee <coughs> belongs to at least one department, but they could belong to more than one. So for example, where I work, I'm part of the IT department and part of the OEM development group. So I develop both for external customers and for internal purposes. An employee works on zero or more projects. And each project must have at least one employee. Otherwise, it's not a project. And maybe have multiple employees assigned to it. So that is taking that and converting it into this. Again, if you can explain what those little symbols mean, you could probably take that to your manager and explain to them, say, there you go. This is how I envision how the data is related. Yay. Now, we're starting to leak into the land of logical versus conceptual. So the next step is identifying primary keys. And when you look back at your paragraph, there's a bunch of things in there that you can use to identify what your primary keys would be. And at this point, they're not necessarily primary keys more than um, candidate keys. But the paragraph is so simple that it's the same thing. A supervisor has a supervisor number. A department has a name. A project has a number. An employee has an employee number. That is how you'd uniquely identify this data based on the paragraph you were given. Once you get down to the physical design, it's not going to look anything like this. However, by the same token, there's um, a variety of little bits and pieces in here that you could adjust. Now, it's time to identify the attributes. And what this is, what this diagram is actually going to be in the end is what they call an extended conceptual diagram where all the attributes are like little bubbles around each of the entities. Uh, you could actually turn it into a proper logical diagram by taking all that and putting it in a table format with lines connecting the tables. And I'll, I'll demonstrate after the break what the differences are. Uh, yeah, it's a wall of text. Uh, but when you identify attributes, you try to identify and name all the attributes essential to the system. So in, like I discussed last week, you want to try to find everything that makes sense for the system and only that. No more, because then it's junk that nobody's ever going to use. No less, because then you're suffering from data loss. You don't want to JPEG your entire life to the point where it's all blurry. Now, the best way to do this is to study the forms, files, and reports currently kept by the users of the system as is. And you spend time circling on the paper copies or, you know, if you've got, a, if you've got a one of those fancy tablets that lets you draw right on the screen, you can use that too. Cross out those that aren't transferred to the new system. 
So you may actually have like an invoice and half that stuff is never used. And, and anybody here ever work in a place where you actually had to hand fill invoices? Okay, you know half those boxes you never used? Right, because they were just standard invoice templates. They probably went to Staples and bought a, bought a box of sta invoices. And you had like all these extra little boxes you never filled in. That you'd cross out because if you're not going to use them, don't include them for the ride. Um, anything that's circled should represent the attributes you need. Always make sure those are valid. Um, Murphy's Law would state that, you know, you've been given 100 samplers and one field is never used in any of those 100 samplers. And you go talk to the guy in shipping and goes, yeah, I use one of those fields once every thousand orders. Oh, well, I guess we've got to keep that. So you've got to go around and check with all your end users, make sure you're not losing anything. That's part of the information gathering portion of this process. Um, now later on, you guys get a system design analysis course. I, if I remember correctly, not 100% sure, but I think so. And you'll learn about running interviews for this kind of stuff in that. Um, in our paragraph, the only attributes that were indicated are the names of the departments, supervisors, employees, and some numbers to uniquely identify stuff. So then, after you've identified your attributes, you map them. So each attribute should belong to only one entity. In other words, an employee has a name. It should only exist against the employee. You wouldn't put employee name against project because it's the employee's name. It has nothing to do with the project. The project name or the project number, on the other hand, belongs to the project. And uh, sometimes you add, need to modify, add a modifier on it so it makes sense. For example, if you, everything comes up as the word name, <coughs> yay, then you might need to know if it's a customer's name or you know an employee name, a product name, that kind of stuff. Um, if you end up with attributes that are left over because you can't figure out what they belong to, uh, you may have missed something along the way. You need to go revisit your ident entity identification process because you have all these things and you don't know what they belong to. They belong to something because they were identified as being important, but what do they belong to? I guess as good as mine. You've got to go through the process until everything's interconnected. So, where there's a few things we discovered, right? Department name belongs to the entity. There's an attribute called supervisor number belongs to the supervisor entity. These are just different attributes that belong to each of the entities. So then we end up with this really blurry diagram, which is going to be terrible for seeing it up on the screen. I know it is. And it's barely usable, viewable on the slide when I'm looking at it on my screen too. Um, but this is a fully attributed diagram at this point. So it is somewhere between a logical and a conceptual diagram. It's what they call an extended logical, I mean, an extended conceptual diagram. It has all the attributes identified running off as little bubbles. And depending on how it's drawn, some people will do these little T's. Other people like drawing basically attribute bubbles around it where they have each of the attributes as separate lines with a, a line connecting for each single attribute to the entity. There's different styles. They all amount to the same thing in the end. But when you look at all this stuff over here, you'll have one thing that you'll notice that is different. And I'm going to use my mouse so that it's recorded. If I can bring my mouse back from the dead. Right here. You'll notice this looks different. Let me go back three or four slides. So you see employee works on project. Product is basically worked on by an employee. Now, we have an extra entity that showed up to the party. That's called the associative entity. When you see a many-to-many -many relationship, there's actually two associative entities on this diagram, to be precise. But I'm going to focus on the employee project one. Especially when you said an employee works on many projects and a project is assigned to many employees, in a physical da database, there are some that support this, but not very many. You have to stop doing the many-to-many because that's not cool, many to many, because you can't connect many to many. It just doesn't work. So you have to create something in between. Um, it has many names. The most common, at least in the industry, is called an associative entity. I've also heard it called a bridge table, where it bridges two entities. I've also heard it called a habitum table. Has and belongs to many. 
almost nobody uses that phrase anymore. That that came into popularity for a little while, then it went away, but you may run across an old fossil that actually still calls it that. But essentially, it's an associative entity. Its purpose is to resolve a many-to-many -many relationship. And then we got the same deal with the employee department because an employee could belong to more than one department. Each department can have more than one employee. So again, it's a many-to-many. -many. We resolve it by creating an associative entity. And in this case, we've called them employee project, employee departments. Now, when you look at those entities, such as this one right here, the department has a name. We know it's its primary key. The employee has an employee number. That's its primary key. What's in the associative entity? The foreign keys that point to the primary keys of the parent tables. So it's, in other words, it's key pair, it's a, it's a compound key, compound primary key, made up of a department name and an employee number. The combination of the two now can never be put into the system twice because that has to be unique. In other words, an employee can only ever belong to a department once, and a department can only ever have each employee in it once. But an employee can belong to more than one department. You should probably have more than one employee, but you can't belong to the same department more than once. That's an associative entity. Now, after you've done your diagram, you go and it's what's the process called check. You look at your diagram from the point of a system owner or a user, and does everything make sense? The data makes sense. Check all your pairs. Make sure everything's sane also. And then you look over at the list of attributes and make sure you haven't lost anything. Makes sense, right? Now, that is basically the process of creating a conceptual diagram. And after you do the conceptual diagram, and I'm going to actually do some of the other stuff next week. Um, however, the next step after you create a conceptual is converting to a physical diagram. And I'm going to be covering the physical diagram next week. The slides on Brightspace aren't quite up to date. I'm trying to pull from some other slides so that you know the content's a little better. Um, of course, nothing like doing it at the last possible minute. Uh, but when you convert to a physical diagram, essentially what happens is you take everything you call an entity, you make a table. Single valued, valued attributes become columns. Key attributes become primary keys. You can say all I'm doing is I'm substituting one word for another word. Multi-valued attributes become tables. Composite attributes become separate columns. In other words, an address is broken down to its component pieces. You ignore derived attributes because there's no reason to store them except for performance reasons. And then you assign the data types. And I'll be going over the common data types next week. And, but you guys are learning Java, so you're going to have a pretty good idea what primitive data types are. It's just in database, the primitive data types are a little more fancy. All right. So I'm actually ahead of schedule. Go figure that one out. Um, so what's going to happen is I'll call a break now for 10 minutes so that you know I don't get called out on not giving people breaks again. And then uh, when I come back, I'm actually going to actually do, do a, an example on the board so we actually understand the process a little better. OK? OK. During the break, some of you watched me type in my little story. So here's my little story, what we're going to diagram. I use something similar to this almost every year. Uh, usually in different ways, but this is what I'm using. So, and I got a typo. So, we have a pet adoption center. So, for this, you could think the SPCA, like what's down on Hunt Club, if you want to go look at animals and pet animals, you know. There's a, each center has many pets. And a pet's identified by an animal number, a species, a breed if applicable, age, weight, and color. A pet can be adopted by a single adoptive person. The ad adoptive person has a name, phone number, and address. When you go and adopt an animal, normally you go to the SBCA. They don't ask you, what's the name of everybody in your family? They ask, what's your name? That's all they're asking. Who are you? Where do you live? What's your phone number? Give me your credit card. That's essentially it. Now, we're not going to worry about the credit card part. Uh, a pet has medical history because usually when they're brought in, they keep a track of an entire history of the animal. You know, there's the initial exam, the deworming, you know, rabies shots, maybe microchipping, snipping. 
whichever else they happen to do to this animal. Um, and then each location has multiple kennels, and each pet is assigned to a single kennel. So in this case, I'm using the phrase kennel very loosely, as in you're not going to put a, you know, a parakeet in a kennel, and you're not going to put a gerbil in a kennel. They'll be in a little cage, but believe it or not, they pretty much refer to it always as a kennel anyways, because that's, you know, bin number five is for gerbil. Bin number six also for gerbils. Got to make sure, you know, gerbil from bin five doesn't mix up with bin six, because they might need lots more bins. So this is our premise. So if we go based on the process we'd had earlier, I'm just going to actually put up the matrix up on the board for starters. Now the question is, do I actually light up this or not? We're going to try. Probably I'm going to have screen glare, but we're going to go with it. So we're going to put in our, uh, our create a matrix as we go. And then we're just going to fill out going down first, and then we'll do the going sideways, because might as well. So in here, what are some of the things that are identified? And I'm talking about entities now, not attributes. OK, pet. Pet or pets? I, well, at one point I talk about each location. Right, so that depends on how you want to interpret the data. Do we want to keep this simple for, to make this go faster? Or do we want to make it complicated to make it take longer? Theoretically, we can say there's one location with plans of expanding to more than one. How's that? So for now, we just assume it's one organization and a story. So we're going to just skip location as a phrase. But yes, we could actually use location or branch or whatever you want to call it. What else do we have in here? Yep. Yep. Adopter. I, I don't even know what the word is for that. A kennel. Yeah, kennels are important. What else we got? Medical. Yeah. Anything else we have on there? Or does that cover pretty much it? Eh? That's it. So now we can actually put our grid going sideways, going the other way. Now at this point in time, we're, we're, but if we're talking about some metal history, medical history when a procedure was done. So at this point in time, a procedure, yes, could be. If we want to, we can. So I'll put it down, then we can decide what to do with it. Again. My incredibly not straight lines. You can't even see where I limp in the same spot in every single one of them. So now we do, based on what's on that, what the connections are. Obviously, we don't need to worry about I'm actually going to put red X's on the ones that don't apply. Because we don't need to worry about these. Because they're all the same going through. Now. A pet to an adopter. The way this is worded is a pet can be adopted by a single adoptive person. We don't talk about whether or not a person can adopt more than one pet or not. But if we go sideways like this, and we can turn over here and go, so we can fill both sides as we go. A pet kennel, a pet is assigned to a kennel.
In this case, the phrase is the same. A kennel has nothing to do with an adopter, so we don't need to touch it. Same thing with um, an adopter here. It doesn't touch the kennel, so that one stays as is. Uh, a pet has medical history. And this is where, you know, earlier you were asking whether a procedure applied or not, whoever it is that brought that up. It gets a little sketchy because the pets versus procedure, there's no real connection because the connection is going to be through a medical procedure. And if we go kennel to adopter, no. Kennel to medical, no. Kennel to procedure, no. Because that has nothing to do with any of it. The medical... Lies to a pet, none of the rest, and the procedure we never spoke about a doctor in the text. There is no doctor. Adoptee? The adopt. And the, no, not at all. The adopter has, I heard doctor, not adopter, sorry. Adopter, the adopter has nothing to do with the medical procedure. I mean, literally you get to adopt the animal, they give you a, basically a report of what was done to them. It has nothing to do with the, it has to do with the pet, not with the, the adopter. Yes? Yeah, well, at this point in time, we're just going to assume it's all one location, so this is all in one place. We could, if we, we had multiple branches, then we'd actually have to go one layer out from this. But that for now, we're going to say it's one location with plans expanding in the future. Just so we don't, we're not here till 7 o'clock tonight. Um, theoretically, yes but it's nowhere in our paragraph, so we don't know. So this is, this is your first experience of a, a person gave you a piece of information and you have questions and they say that piece of paper is everything we know, which is usually a lie. But for now, we're going to pretend we're working with the initial information provided. I mean, I, this happens to me all the time where I've got uh, external customers where our OEM manager does initial information gathering and they'll write up a document that describes their business or their needs and then I start designing based on that and then I'll send it back to them and then there's back and forth until we identify all. That would have been like for round two where suddenly you start talking about, oh, by the way, should we not be able to assign chemicals, chemicals based on isolation awards versus not? Or you could go, same thing, the doctor, not an adopter. It's just my, I just didn't hear you right, it's my fault. Um, but, you know, maybe it should be talked about medical, uh, which, which vet did what, did what. There could be more information that's required. Later on, when we break it all out, there might be even more. But essentially, this is what we have. So we have our entities. We have some relationships. So in theory now, and I'm actually going to move my camera so that I have as much board as humanly possible. That's going to look great on the recording. So now I'm going to start drawing over here. So we're going to take our little boxes because entities are squares. Okay, so here's our entities. And actually, when I wrote this paragraph, I made sure that it was unique in such a sense that I didn't have many-to-many -many relationships in any of it. There's a reason for that. I just, we, we're not 
diving into that right now. That's essentially the reason. So the next step we do is we draw our little diamonds for relationships. And I probably didn't give myself enough room, but that's okay. And we're gonna draw our lines. So we haven't put in our verbs yet. And like I said, we can be really, really lazy and just use the word has everywhere <laughs> because we could. Um, you know, technically a pet has had medical done. Medical has procedures. It's going to be written really small. I was going to say adopts. That's supposed to say assigned, but I didn't give myself enough room. So we drew our relationships. At this point in time, we could say, here's our basic ERD. Based on that paragraph, we did this chart. From this chart, we came up with this basic diagram. No relationships applied yet. And now if we look at um, some of the other stuff in here that we have, is we have, uh, we could draw our relationships. And so a pet can only be ever adopted by one adopter. I really got to come up with a better phrase than that. But they may not have been adopted yet. Therefore, the adopter is optional, right? The pet can be ad adopted by one optionally. But at most, they can be adopted by one. It's just my line's too tight. It should be over here like that. Exactly. It'd go the other way around. You might have somebody that walked in, they're an adopter, they've registered as an adopter, but they haven't adopted anyone yet. Or they may adopt more than one. They might pick one or more. Often they ask you to pre-register. When you say, I want to go adopt a cat, and you come in and they make you register. And then you walk out with like five, because you're a crazy cat person. Now, a pet is assigned to a kennel. Can a pet occupy more than one kennel? And the pet must be assigned. So it's mandatory one. And on the other side, a kennel can only ever have one. Or there might be no pets in that kennel. Pet just got adopted. Kennel's empty. Optionally, there's now no pet in that kennel. It's just about how you think about the process, right? Now, if we were talking, getting a little fancier, which we're not, we could actually have a history of this kennel and see which pets went through that kennel. There'd be a, something else in the middle here, an associative entity between the two showing this, this kennel, this pet this kennel. Suddenly, you know, you have the cats glow under a uh, UV light. If those of you that don't know what that means, it means they have ringworm. It's really cool. I had one of my cats that picked up ringworm outside, and they literally they have cir blue circles that glow when you pass them under a UV light. They're like, you know, black lights. It was really cool. And maybe you need to know what other animals were in that same kennel, so they need all to be checked for historical reasons. Now, a pet has one or more procedures. Well, a p this actually ends up being an associative entity when you think about it, right? Because this associates a pet to a procedure via the history. So a pet has one or more medical history. Theoretically, they may have no medical history because they were literally just dropped off at the pet adoption center. So they've been registered, but there's no other information. So because I didn't give myself enough room, it should look like this. And at the other end, a given piece of medical history has to have a pet, otherwise there's no entry. 
And any given piece of history can only ever belong to one pet, right? Because it's as if, let's apply it to humans. You went to the hospital, they took your blood result. You had a procedure done, they did a blood test on you. Can your results belong to someone else? Eh? Well, yeah, but we're going to go assuming that nobody made any stupid mistakes. It'd be like that. And on the other side, a procedure may or may not have medical history. Maybe there's a new procedure they haven't done to anything yet. Same deal. And at the other end, a medical history must have a procedure. And each entry should be for only one procedure at a time. You, they may do two or three things at once. For example, when I took my cats in to get snipped and they got microchipped at the same time. So that's two separate procedures, but they were actually two separate entries on their history because it was literally two different things that were done. And they don't happen at the same time. They usually, the animals are too small. They're not going to work at one end while they're working at the other end. Just, that's kind of ick. But here we created our relationships now. Now suddenly we've got relationships. Um, so now, if we want, we could actually stop here, theoretically. Or we could expand this diagram, which of course I didn't give myself a whole lot of room to do. But the, what I'm going to do at a, a bare minimum is we're going to add in our keys. And I guess I'm going to use red. Now, pets are identified by what? If we go back to our paragraph, they're identified by an animal a number. As species breed, those are actually attributes. But when the person was writing up your paragraph for you, they put in all these things they thought that was important that they can identify an animal by. But realistically, uh, the number is the important one. So on here we'd have I just don't feel like writing the whole animal number bit. Now, the adopter. Now, a few things here, a little whack. You weren't given something that you could use as an identifier. Now, anybody in here have the same name as someone else they know? Depending what part of the world you're from, you're going to get a lot of that. But yes, I've already had one person here say, yeah, I've got the same name as someone else. Did you know how many Daniel Gujros are in Ottawa? Last time I checked, there's seven. Not unique in any stretch of the imagination. That's useless. On the other hand, what else were they, gi they gave us? A phone number? That's usually pretty unique in this case. This would be our candidate key would be a phone number. An address is an address. In theory, you could have three or four people living at the same address, and they could all be registered, but everybody has different cell phone numbers. And even that's not quite right, um, because theoretically, you could have two people living at the same phone number. That's not unheard of. So what problem do we have? In this case, we end up with a compound key. For now, once you get to the physical design, this would all change. But for now, we can look at the adopter and say, name plus phone number is probably unique. The odds of two people with the same name living at the same phone number? Not impossible, but not likely, at least not in Canada. Some other countries where you only have one name, it's entirely possible. So if we look at the adopter, we create ourselves called uh, one with name and phone. For now, I'm just identifying the keys. Now, we haven't been given anything about the kennel, so we know nothing about the kennel. Can we derive, I don't mean derive as in derive data, but based on what we understand of how the world works, is there something we could say we can use to identify a kennel? A kennel number. I mean, it's just like a suitcase box. There's a number. So we, could, we can start guessing at this point. Um, a procedure. Again, we don't know what it is, but odds are the procedure has a name. And odds are they're not going to have the same name for two different procedures. Anybody who's ever seen medical terminology knows exactly what I'm talking about. There's no such thing as the same procedure, two procedures with the same name. So we could theoretically just go with name. Uh, 
And then medical history. At this point in time, we don't know exactly a whole lot. They say, when was it done? Great. Pardon? I, had, I heard two voices at the same time. One of you pick what you're going to say, or I'm going to go with the guy who's lifting his hand. Go. Yeah, which is basically at the vet, that'd be the, your, your records number, which is the same thing as a pet number. Um, which means at least in here, if nothing else, this is an associative entity, right? It became because somebody brought up the concept of procedures as a separate entity. We have a, an associative entity here in the middle. Now, when if we go back thinking about what we saw on the slides about 20 minutes ago, half an hour ago, what was special about the associative entity? They were breaking this down, but in here, what was its primary key? From the other two. So in here, we'd have... Now, I'm going to be careful on this one. I'm going to leave it as it. Because I'm going to take a picture of this, and next week, I'm going to get back to this and actually add detail to this process. Because this basically covers what we covered. Honestly, just so you have a heads up, this isn't enough. Because, for example, anybody here been hospitalized, say, in the last three years? How many times they take your blood? How many times they run the same blood test? At least twice. Usually you go in for something, they check your blood, and then just before they discharge you, they check your blood and they check, you know. They like to poke you and take lots of blood. You end up being anemic by the time they're done. But, you know, obviously they're doing the same procedure over the same test over and over and over again to test your status. Therefore, realistically, not only is it who and what, there's also the when that applies. But at this case, we don't know enough about this because we haven't gone through the process of the discussion with a third entity. Therefore, honestly, part of this, there should actually be a timestamp added to this. And at this point, now we're up to the point where we almost have the entirety of the table as part of the primary key, which leads us to something in else, which is, eh. You don't want too much stuff in your primary key. So as part of the design process next week, when we go past this, we'll be expanding this stuff. Yes? Yeah, I just, I just got lazy. That should have read. Medical history. It's everything that ever happened to this animal since they were brought in to when they were checked out. So that is the process, essentially, from a paragraph of text to this chart, to a conceptual diagram, mostly what they call an extended. We didn't add the rest of the attributes on here. And I'll actually throw them on real quick without a lot of discussion because we've already identified them in here. Um, but basically, we've got the whole thing. Uh, the last ones that we'd be missing on here would be And then kennel does make a difference. That takes care of the when. The heck else did I say? Species. Age. Age, weight, and color. There. 
So these are the things that were identified in this, completely described with lots of colors. Um, so when you look at this diagram, other than the fact that I used blue for the relationships, basically attributes are blue, keys are red, relationships are green, and entities are black. If I had a fifth color, I would have used a different color to do these little guys. But I left my, co my colorful markers at home. So that's what I had to work with. So this is the process from paragraph to diagram. You can now, at this point, you take this and convert this to a logical diagram, which I'll talk about next week. And then from logical to physical, which is a very small step after that. I just need to add one more set of slides in front of the, the ones that I have got there now for you guys. I've been trying to figure out how to tweak it so it's a little more, a um, little less crazy how I'd approach the topic. But that's it. So as promised, this one's not as long as last week's. Because <laughs> I knew last week was bad. Um, so what you're going to, what you need to tackle on this week is lab three. It's a quiz. You get to try it multiple times. I double checked on the weekend because somebody sent me a message saying, I can't take another one. Yeah, you can. If you can't, you just got to go start a new one. Um, lab two is due by Thursday, 7.30 p.m. Um, you should be taking a look at what the assigned reading is. I will double check, make sure I didn't miss it this time in the announcement. Um, and you should be looking at the hybrids so you don't fall behind and have to rush at the end of the term. Hybrids one, two, and three actually do apply to this these topics. So there you have it. Four? What's four? No, well, no, it's just, just a, that's just the, what you should be atta attacking this week. I'm not talking about assignments yet. That's coming. Don't worry, that's coming. Don't use the word assignment <laughs> until it comes for real. Okay, so I'm going to hit the stop record button here and we're out of here.